All right, I think we're live. <laughs> so, hey, everybody, I'm Stephen Bauman, and welcome to episode five of the live sketch series. In this one, I am going to be making up for what I thought was a pretty, like, kind of average value study the last time I did this. I was starting that portrait of Lady Agnew and I kind of realized at the end of it that I had I had made this study that was actually like not large enough like I kind of focused a little bit more on the scene and a little bit less on the actual portrait when in fact like in retrospect the thing that I was so interested about in the in the study that I wanted to do was just the portrait so I'm coming back for uh, another kind of uh, bite at the apple here. So um, uh, this one will be a lot more kind of focused in on the, the actual head study uh, of Lady Agnew, uh, which is, of course, a painting by Sargent that all of you know, and I'm sure that you know it really, really well. So um, if you don't, by the way, uh, it's at the Scottish National Gallery, I think. Um, and they have a really great kind of accessible image of it online where you can, um, I guess it's kind of like a stream of the image. Like you can't actually download their, their super high res image, but you can, um, uh, you can kind of look at it like zoomed in really, really tight. And uh, so that's kind of super cool. By the way, just let um, me know, by the way, uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, just let me know that the sound works okay so that my conscience is clear and I can kind of focus on uh, just uh, painting away. Uh, also, I, I'm always answering questions during these streams. So um, if you have a question or a curiosity about something, uh, just let me know. And if in one of the moments when I can kind of look over to the uh, to the monitor, if I can see that, then I will get to it kind of ASAP. Yeah, so anyway, that's all the admin I had to take care of which is basically just, you know, I need to kind of um, redeem myself for, uh, for a poor performance. <laughs> anyway, and those of you also like watching on Instagram as well, if you have uh, like some questions there also, um, I'm kind of open to, to take those as well. I'm going to move the head over a little bit. I kind of want it more, want it more centered on the... Um, on the canvas for this uh, for this study and I'm just blocking in like in really really big kind of swatches of, uh, of value and later I'm gonna go in and kind of refine all of those into their uh, into the kind of different parts that I think are are going to be most impactful most useful for uh, for the painting but for now like I want to start out with um for now i want to start out just with the that that really big impression and see if i can if i can get that if i get that then hey you know anything's possible right uh let's see probably a couple of questions coming in callum gillespie is asking when you oil paint how much medium do you tend to use and begin with cool question actually uh and and this is a kind of like across the board for me is is I tend to actually use very little medium uh, in total. So uh, whenever I'm um, whenever I'm oil painting, uh, I just use a tiny bit of linseed oil, and then I actually don't use very much of it, uh, very much of it at all. Um, uh, that way, I keep like a really kind of lean surface in my painting, and uh, I don't get these like extra kind of sticky looking surfaces that uh, I think we can normally associate with kind of using too much medium or too diverse mediums. Like my feeling is that, and I have nothing against, by the way, like this is not like, oh, you shouldn't use mediums. Use mediums, do what you gotta do. Uh, but my feeling is normally like with a medium, I'm, I'm usually trying to solve something that I, that I, I could solve like another way. Uh, like I could solve it, um, for instance, by uh, just uh, painting more thinly in the initial stages, or I could solve it by, um, you know, giving the paint more time to dry or using like a set of pigments that dries faster. Like, you know, the, the, the medium that everybody, you know, tends to like uh, uh, run to is the one that, that gets your paint to kind of dry faster, right? Because oil paint, of course, it dries really slow. And so we have 
um, usually some complications in, in getting it to dry and that's, uh, that can be a bit of a bummer. But if you actually use, for instance, like a raw umber, uh, just on your palette, like a, just a pigment like raw umber, you can usually get your paint to dry really, really quite fast. Um, so you have this kind of like baked in advantage if you're using, if you're using raw umber. So just to say, there's like a lot of ways kind of around that, uh, that problem of like wanting your kind of paint to dry a little bit faster, which is a totally understandable thing to, uh, to want. It's nothing to say like, oh, shouldn't want your paint to dry fast. Sure. Why wouldn't you? Anyway, hopefully this time I do like a decent version of this portrait. I did. I felt like the last time I was so um, distracted actually by all the extra stuff that I was painting that I didn't actually get to the the really kind of interesting parts that that I wanted to get to. So a bunch of questions coming in. Kim Farrell is asking, do you oil oil in or oil out with each layer? Uh, I do it sometimes. I got to tell you, like. I more often will oil out when I'm doing like a, a demo painting, like for, for Patreon. Whereas like if I'm making my own painting, I tend to kind of find other ways around it just because, you know, ideally you, know, you don't want to be caught like kind of always needing to oil out. Um, you know, if you, if you get really, you know, pedantic about, your painting practices, you know, you want to oil out actually as rarely as possible. Like it's not, it's not great to just be, you know, like spreading a whole bunch of uh, oil over the surface of your, um, of your painting. You'd actually much rather uh, keep your surface kind of relatively lean. Um, I mean, if you talk to, you know, experts like uh, George O'Hanlon or, you know, he's the, guy that runs natural pigments, the paint company. Uh, so if you talk to him, like he'll tell you, well, you know, you want a pretty lean painting surface. Uh, you don't want to be using like, uh, having a ton of medium like floating around. Um, but eventually, you know, we need, we need some practical solutions also to a problem, which is you kind of can't see what you're, what you're trying to paint. And that, uh, that of course, creates a bit of resistance, a little bit of difficulty, and uh, it's something that we want to eventually overcome. Uh, but like I said, you know, there's a lot of different ways to kind of overcome that. Yeah, so uh, there's a bunch of questions that um, uh, that I'm going to miss just because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm painting here. So you got to forgive me for, uh, uh, for not getting all of them uh, that come in. PV is asking, do you experience sinking in and needing to oil out for the next layer? Yeah, of course, you know, like... You know, I'm human. <laughs> you know, if you uh, if you paint in oil, you know that's like a part of the game. Is that you're gonna get that that sense of like sinking in, and it's gonna it's gonna annoy you, right? So um, I don't think any any way really around the sinking in itself. Uh, I think it's just about developing strategies to kind of work a little bit more around it. Um, so hopefully that uh, hopefully that helps. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, it's like one of those things, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily to be totally avoided either. Like, you know, there's people who use, you know, different things in their mediums, like they'll use, um, varnishes and stuff in an effort to like avoid the sinking in. I just think it's, you know, it's so, it's such a natural part of like the oil paint kind of drying process. Uh, I don't, I don't really try to escape it as much as I do just kind of deal with it. You know, it's, it's just like, well, it's kind of raining outside that kind of sucks, but you know, that's, I can't change the weather, you know? Um, so that's kind of my feeling about it, uh, for whatever that's, uh, for whatever that's worth a lot, a lot of, I mean, you know, there's painters out there that are going to tell you, like, give you like really interesting ways to kind of get around that. I say, great, try them out. If in the long run, they're like healthy for your painting, then I think that will, that will show up like it will show up that they're good for your painting and so um you know if you if you need it go for it let's see anthony 
Rodney Alvior is asking, which medium are you most comfortable working with? Over the years, I've tried a lot of different mediums. I mean, even I can remember a time in Florence when I was using stand oil and triple rectified turpentine and Canada balsam in my medium. So I was using like some really pretty exotic admixtures and, uh, you know, while it kind of solved one problem, kind of tended to like create some other problems as well. So uh, eventually nowadays, and this is probably like a theme, if you if you work with me as a student, like you'll have heard me kind of talk about things this way, but I, I generally just try and keep things as simple as possible. So if there is a way that I can kind of cut out some part of the process or some complication, I'm going to do that. And for me, it was always very easy, I think, eventually just to work with linseed oil. So I, I, all I use is a little bit of linseed oil. I don't, uh, I don't mix in any terps. I don't mix in any, uh, any varnishes, obviously. Uh, I don't mix in much of anything at all. Um, I've been tempted lately just to put in a little tiny bit of, um, little tiny bit of solvent just to kind of get the paint to flow a little bit faster and dry like or not dry but like become tacky a little bit faster um become a little bit less slippery in a way this is actually what <clears throat> what i'm after uh, because the solvent kind of evaporates it kind of gets you out of that jam a little bit faster and uh i've been tempted to do that but I am just kind of taking my, uh, my own advice and just trying to fix it just by, by how I'm painting, more so than like what I'm painting with, you know. Um, experimentation's great and you gotta try stuff out, uh, but you know, you also wanna kinda know why you're trying it out. You know, it's, it's one of those things like if, you, if you're always like kinda reaching for that new medium or whatever it is, you know, you might miss some of the other solutions that that could be available to you. But you know, I sound like really pious and everything when I talk about mediums and stuff, but I mean the reality is I just don't want to like complicate my my painting process any more than I have to. And so that's my way of just like um uh using that kind of KISS principle, right? Keep it simple. Uh, if I can keep it simple, I'm absolutely going to. Someone, by the way, the other, uh, there was, I was doing a stream a while back and someone was saying, because uh, the KISS principle, right, is K-I-S-S, which is keep it simple, stupid. But I was saying, oh, maybe I just take the last S off that because there's no reason to say stupid, you know. Simplicity and stupidity don't have really anything to do with each other. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe the quote is saying like, uh, um, is not calling the other uh, the idea simple but or, or stupid but uh reminding you because you're stupid to keep it anyway whatever the point is uh, i just wanted to um remove the stupid part from it um <clears throat> and that that person said oh uh, i would have used then like occam's razor which i i didn't know and i still don't know probably like how how exactly that relates uh, so i'm sure that by the way somebody watching this will have some insight about that uh, that you can you can offer anyway kiss principle right keep it simple and uh, so that's definitely what I do with my painting painting is hard enough already without <clears throat> like inserting all these extra I think a lot about like variables when I'm when I'm working right like I want uh, as few moving parts as possible you know because you got to kind of keep track of everything that's happening in your painting you've ever heard of the kind of metaphor where a painting teacher or whoever, whatever, somebody talking about painting will uh, say that painting in a way is a lot like juggling, right? Like you have to kind of keep all these balls up in the air all at the same time. And of course, that's the challenge, right? Is that you have to do it all at once because everything is like the, the paint film is wet. So it has a kind of finite amount of like work time that you can have. So your best bet 
when you're painting to be kind of most efficient is to kind of try and juggle everything at once, which obviously also contains with it the challenge of juggling all those things at once. And so, oh, by the way, I should, uh, this is like total digression here, but I should mention, I'm doing basically a no-tan study of this portrait uh, where I'm focusing almost exclusively just on the kind of whatever 10 major values uh, that I can that I can locate in it. So there'll be areas where I kind of oversimplify the value. Like, you know, over over here on this this left hand side uh, by her head, I don't really think I have like enough values in my my scale of 10 values to actually truly represent the value relationships there. So I'm going to kind of simplify them. And what that leads to eventually is sometimes like an image that uh, will look like a little bit different from from how you think it'll look. And also, by the way, if you're like watching on YouTube rather than on Instagram, for all of you watching on Instagram, by the way, this this stream is also in HD on, on YouTube if you wanted to watch it there uh, as well. Um, but you'll find that uh, it kind of compresses values in certain areas. Um, uh, and that's, again, part of the kind of experience of doing, I think, a no-tan study is is working in that limitation of value that's that's really kind of challenging to uh, to use. Uh, I'm trying to be like, again, just as brief and simple as possible. If I can solve it with one value, then I'm going to do it. Now, in the last stream I did, yeah, I mentioned before, right, that like this is actually a do-over. <laughs> like the the last time I did a uh, a live stream, I did this painting, uh, but I had it zoomed out too far, and I didn't I didn't actually like the the study eventually, and it didn't get to the reason I didn't like it is because it didn't really get to the stuff I wanted to get to, which was, you know, some of the like compressed value relationships like within the head, like that's what I was uh, really kind of interested in, and so. I decided to do it over. Something that was mentioned, though, was like this area on the upper left. Um, that's an area where I really had to kind of compress the values. And I'm saying like in no tan studies, sometimes you compress values in a way that makes it seem really, you know, I guess really, really strange or really different from what what you think it should look like. Um, just because you're working in that limitation of value, you know, uh, you're not you don't have like all the value in the world to uh, to express the little kind of faint nuances in between things. You've got to uh, do it with less value or less value variation. So anyway, <clears throat> I was talking about this area like up here on the left and and how I'd kind of compressed it into like an overall like much darker area. And I hadn't even thought about it. But of course, that's, that's absolutely what I was doing was uh, kind of compressing that into um, a much darker value than, than what it would be. And you'll see me a lot during this stream, if you're looking uh, on YouTube, you'll see me squinting down a lot. Like I'm squinting down and kind of looking at my, uh, I'm looking at my Wacom, Wacom tablet, right? And just trying to see the, the value relationships there. And when you squint down, of course, you get a little bit of a kind of compressed vision of what those values are. Um, and that, of course, is a massive assistance in terms of helping you see values. Um, you do have to like practice like how to do that and basically what it means when you're kind of squinting down and stuff. But suffice to say, you know, it's always going to be an assistance to you when you're trying to see if you got your values right to uh, to squint down. And that's how you come up with, I think, sometimes some very interesting value solutions. Uh, as you kind of squint down, it actually kind of changes a little bit the way that you that you look at things sometimes. Anyway, that is my bit on squinting down. Um, it's super useful, and uh, you're gonna see me doing it. That's why I like probably I imagine it looks pretty funny. <laughs> like you're watching this guy, and I'm like just squinting down, like staring at at my uh, at my tablet here. But I'm just trying to see the value as well. Uh, there's other things you can do as well, like um, if if those of you out there have like heard of a black mirror, um, that'll also kind of help you compress the values. Yeah, let's take another question here. So Kim Farrell is asking, I heard Maxfield Parrish 
varnish between layers is it true are there advantages can i go back to an old oil painting and revise it without having to remove the varnish or is that a huge no-no you know uh, kim it's a great question and the factual answer to it is yes it is a no-no you shouldn't do it because it depends a little bit well there's several reasons why you shouldn't do it one of the reasons why you shouldn't do it is because oil paint actually takes a really long time to dry and in order to dry, it needs to oxidize, right? Uh, oil paint dries by absorbing oxygen. And so when you put a layer of varnish over something, what you're doing is actually blocking the oxygen from getting into that layer, thus stopping the paint from drying, many times prematurely. That leads to the next part, which is the reason it, it usually uh, um, is not recommended is because oil paint takes... Um, depending upon how like thickly you will paint it, it can take between uh, three and six months to dry. Now, those are approximations based on uh, obviously like um, environmental conditions uh, that are that are you know set maybe optimally. So consider right that your oil painting probably while you're working on it probably has not had a chance to dry because most of us you know when we make a painting we're not waiting six months in between layers we're going a lot faster than that and uh, in addition to that uh, like I said you know uh, well actually not in addition to that I wanted to stop that thought there and kind of move on to the next thought. Um, now that's I think like the basic reason why you shouldn't do it. The next part of your question, which was, can you just work on a painting after it's been varnished uh, without stripping the varnish away? No, not really, because and the, well, this is hmm, this is where it's like, how serious are you about this painting? But I kind of feel like when you do something, when you practice something, it becomes like a part of what you do, a part of your problem solving. And so whether or not the painting is like the most serious painting you've ever done <clears throat> or it's just a study that you're doing i tend to try to keep you know uh or i rather like kind of take them quite seriously and so i wouldn't do this if even if i was just doing a study uh, but the thing that that will do right is that basically your oil paint will then be on top of a layer that can be reconstituted with solvent so when you're stripping away varnish, right? I mean, varnish is made essentially so that it can be stripped away. Like it's protecting the surface of your painting from uh, um, negative effects based on the environment where it was stored in. Think of oil paintings that are like in churches in, uh, in Italy or something and they're full of like uh, smoke from candle burning and whatever else, right? <clears throat> um, so if you're a restorer kind of going into that, what you would do is you would start by kind of stripping the varnish. Well, you'd start by doing some tests, but then you'd probably want to you'd want to strip away the varnish that was on the painting, um, uh, and thus take away also like the dirt and kind of environmental bits and pieces that are uh, adversely affecting the uh, the appearance of the painting. Uh, so if your oil paint, uh, your your layer that you repainted, is kind of bonded to that to that layer of varnish it's going to come off with the varnish so um that's the problem with kind of painting a um you know painting on top of a layer of varnish is that basically you're you're kind of securing your oil paint your newly painted picture to something that is um easy to disrupt or uh, or or destroy right so that's why you wouldn't do it and that's why i say also like it kind of depends like is this a really important painting or not if it is then you definitely don't want to do it if it's just like a sketch or a study or whatever and you just need to you know you just want to try something out then i mean it's to it's certainly possible to paint on top of that it's, it's possible to do many things but whether or not i would recommend doing it would be another another story uh, so I hope that uh, hope that kind of helps uh, a little bit of the kind of background. I'm not, I mean, I'm not a restorer. This is just stuff that I know um, just from, you know, being at school and studying. And and, and uh, I know a couple of, uh, of art restorers. Um, so, you, you know, you kind of gather bits and pieces of, of knowledge based on, 
based on the, the time that you spend doing this stuff. Anyway, so uh, there you go, Cam. I hope that helps. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, do you, uh, Paul Pina is asking, do you enjoy more on drawing on, on paper on Procreate? Uh, of course, Procreate, the uh, iPad app. Actually, I don't really draw almost at all on, on, on Procreate anymore. For a little while I did because I was doing, well, just I didn't have a Cintiq and I didn't use Photoshop. And so uh, there were some reasons why um, I was drawing on Procreate, but I don't really uh, um, do that much at all anymore. Um, I thought it was fine. I, you know, like drawing on an iPad, I think uh, on Procreate is, is a decent, I think it's a decent surface, you know, I mean, for, for what it is. And if you're, you know, if you're going to be engaging in like uh, digital painting, I don't see why you wouldn't, you know, at least, you know, use, uh, use that a bit. Um, but I think eventually the kind of professional standard is a bit more Photoshop. And that's kind of why I switched over as far as like whether I enjoy analog or digital more. I enjoy analog more. Like I'll always be an analog artist. Um, you know, it's what I studied for, you know, four years in, uh, in Italy and, you know, kind of what I've dedicated my uh, all of my time to for the last, I don't know, 20 years or something. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's already like I'm bought in. <laughs> you know, I, I bought land, you know, on the whole um, representational painting in the analog world. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of it for me. Uh, but it's a nice diversion to, to draw on uh, digital media. And um, for me, anyway, I mean, other people do it professionally. I don't mean to diminish that at all. Uh, but I'll never I'll never do it like as a I'll never have a job as like a professional, you know, digital painter or anything. That's not in the future for me. Way more people that are way better at it <laughs> than I am. I like to use it because I feel like it's a good like kind of communication tool. Uh, like for, for things like this right now, you know, I mean, it's, it's so great just to be able to, uh, kind of dive into the painting without, without kind of some of the hangups of like analog, um, analog work, like drying time and things. Uh, so for me, like I said, it's a, it's a tool of communication. I kind of love it for that. And, you know, it's, everything else is just, you know, uh, incidental to, to me anyway, to my needs, at least. Toby. Michael is asking, oh, no, I just, the, the chat scrolled past it. In your own practice, is there a reason you don't do many what could be considered multi-figure compositions in the context of an outdoor space or interior? That's a kind of cool question, you know, and, and it, it was asked. There's, um, there's a guy that uh, I got to know. Well, I met him initially in Florence, but then when my wife and I were living in, uh, in New Jersey, um, we saw him a lot more because he's uh, he lived uh, across the river in, in Manhattan, and his name is uh, Peter Trippi. He's the well, whatever. He's a, an editor and an art critic, etc. Um, curator, extraordinary. He's a really great guy, by the way. <laughs> but um, aside from all of that, uh, in conversations, he's always he's always kind of bring that up. Like he was always kind of touting the idea that you know as representational painters you know where where was that at nowadays basically right because you look at history and you find you know that it was always like kind of the pinnacle of an artist's expression was you know these big canvases right these eventually you know some history paintings and um you know it was i think it, in, a, in a way eventually it was just a different is a different time for artists back then, you know. Um, but it kind of brings up a little bit what my feeling is about it. And it's, as a professional, this is going to sound terrible. I, I get this. Uh, but as a professional, there's honestly just not a lot of call for those kind of paintings. And it's not that that means, oh, you can't do it or you shouldn't do it. It simply means there's not a lot of call for it. So if you're out there in the world and like this is your career, you know, a lot of times you kind of have to spend your time making something else. Um, you know, there's very few people out there, for instance, that 
that get to like, you know, just make giant multi-figure oil paintings um, and have that be for them like financially viable. You know, and this is just like harsh reality stuff. You know, it's it's not like the romantic, you know, vision of a painter just kind of doing whatever they want. You know, for me, I, I kind of had to uh, figure out how to make this work for me for real. Um, so that's the reason basically I don't do it. It's just there's there's in the market, there's not like a lot of call for it. Even, you know, my passion, of course, is, is actually drawing. Like I love oil painting, don't get me wrong. But I equally or more so love drawing like as an art form that's why i've always kind of pursued it um along with painting right even if you know i i paint half the time you know the rest of that time i'll spend drawing it. I'll, i genuinely engage in making artworks i don't start out thinking oh maybe i'll make a painting of this i think i'm gonna make a drawing that's what i'm passionate about but i i will i come up against you know gallerists that will tell you Oh, well, no, like I don't sell drawings like we just don't we don't sell them. You know, there's not we don't I don't have a market for them or whatever. They use like a lot of different reasons, you know, why they, they don't do it. Um, but basically, it's that their clientele uh, are usually just not attuned to uh, to drawings as like a medium that they collect. And so for the for the dealers, for the art dealers, it's kind of like, well, what am I going to do with a with an artwork that I can't I can't sell? So, you know. Um, so I'll just say, oh, I, no, if you have any oil paintings, I'm interested, but I'm not interested in, uh, in drawing. So huge bummer, but, you know, that's kind of, that's the reality of the uh, of the market in, in places, I guess. Uh, that won't stop me from making drawings just because, like I said, it's one of the things I really, really take a lot of joy in. It's one of the reasons I kind of became an artist to begin with. Um, so I could I could make really good drawings and I'm, I'm not about to stop. The multi-figure composition question um, is a little bit more involved because, you know, at a certain point, I mean, I guess you could, you know, paint them at a scale that was uh, not discouraging, which is to say, you know, if you make a giant multi-figure painting, you know, that takes up, that could take up years of your life which, you know, I've already committed kind of years and years to doing this stuff. So it's not the years I'm afraid of. It's, it's taking years and years and then, you know, having the problem also of like, well, how do you take this thing to market in a, apparently in a market that's not really interested in it. So anyway, that's my, my harsh reality answer to, uh, to that one. Let's see. Ross, uh, round, round Sevel, round Sevel is asking, have you ever seen a painting you were impressed by but couldn't work how they work out how they achieved the effect? That's a kind of interesting question. Um, you know, because I can remember like going to museums, certainly as a student, and well, I guess it, you know what, it depends upon what you mean by effect. <laughs> because I think as a student, I remember going to museums and I'd be amazed by like these, you know, 19th century painters making paintings that quite honestly, were so beyond my understanding. I think there's even been paintings I honestly didn't even, I don't even think I knew how good they were uh, when I first saw them. And that's like a real thing that that, that I can say is that for, for all of you out there, you know, your eyes are not always good enough actually to, to understand what's so great about a painting. Um, there was a, an artist that, that uh, was a teacher when I was at the academy, and I remember he had this, um, and I, if, by the way, if you guys have watched a lot of my streams, then probably the story is old news, so I'll get it over fast. But he was saying that uh, he had gone to this exhibition of Lepage, uh, Bastien Lepage in Paris, and it occurred to him that when he had seen Lepage's paintings in the past, his eyes were actually not sufficiently, you know, I don't know, uh, attuned um, to understand actually how good they were. And it wasn't until seeing this exhibition later on that he actually realized how amazing these Lepage paintings were. So, you know, in that sense, and the Lepage work, you know, it's if you know his work, it's not always really about 
like a painterly effect, which is to say like, you know, some uh, glaze or some light effect or whatever it is. Uh, it's, it's more just like, you know, really amazing, super refined uh, design and just great painting in general. So that I can remember, you know, and I, and, and thinking about it now, I know that I didn't have the eyes to see that or understand how he was so adept at what he was doing. Uh, so the answer is absolutely yes, but maybe it's not so much as like a, uh, like an effect, like we will think about, you know, effects, like it was, you know, some glaze or something. It was more for me, um, how to just achieve like a really excellent picture, you know, like that is an amazing thing to do. And I think probably I could still go to museums now and, and really not fully grasp, you know, how something so transcendent was, uh, was made. So there you go. Let's see. Another question. <laughs> Jen, uh, even who uh, says that she uses for the kiss principle, she uses, uh, keep it simple, sweetheart, instead of keep it simple, stupid, which I'm fully on board with, I fully support that uh, augmentation of the KISS principle. Um, let's see, Diligent Visual says, or asks, I'm interested in opening a hybrid online in-person art training program. I've been an artist and educator for over 20 years. Have you managed to succeed in this space? <sighs> wow, uh, it's a cool question. I mean, it, well, oof, gosh, you know what? There's so much to unpack about that question. Uh, I mean, first, you know, we just got to look at, you know, what your what your kind of goals are, you know? Uh, I think that a big part of, you know, succeeding in this space, and I tell this to students as well, like, so, I mean, this kind of, this actually kind of covers uh, both sides of the kind of content that I would I would put out, but I would say that tenacity is an absolutely requisite quality if you're going to be an artist. I think that you are going to face resistance all the time. And it's not only going to be from outside. You're going to face resistance even in yourself. You're going to look at your work and think, oh, I don't think this is good enough. Or you're going to, you know, or you're going to feel lazy that day. Or, you're, you know, there's so many things that can, like, stand in your way if you're not if you have like some question about whether or not you're gonna do it I think that's enough for it to to not happen I mean that this sounds like harsh but you know you, you really have to kind of decide where you want to be and, and once you do that right then then you can talk about like strategy and things you can talk about well all right how do I do the best version of, of what that is but um, just making sure that you're kind of in it as an artist or, or I guess as a business owner. Um, after that, uh, I think you take that tenacity into like another another place basically and, and we say that, um, you know, for me, you know, success was eventually, you know, I think I needed to have a, uh, build a, a following. And so, you know, I've been on Instagram for maybe... I've probably been on Instagram for maybe three years or so before I ever really thought of, oh, I'll do something with my audience. Like, you know, it was just a place where I like posted work or I saw something, uh, I don't know, that I thought was cool and I'd share it with, you know, I guess whoever followed me at the time. And um, of course, like I'd been, I'd been around, I'd been in magazines and things. So like I was able to... Uh, kind of I probably had a, like a little bit of a jump start in terms of like audience building from that um but eventually I got serious about it after maybe maybe another year or so like I was like all right well if I'm actually going to do something with this audience um you know then I've got to uh I got to really like kind of commit myself to to what I'm doing here um so all right, so those of you like, so let's talk, I guess it's audience building really is, is what I need to, to talk about. But I think that you want to consider that 
people are following you for them, not for you. Like, and I, I think you know some artists can make this mistake that they their account is is really about kind of how cool they are, and you know that's fine. Uh, you know, I mean, it's cool to be cool, uh, but really, you know, if you want to have kind of a larger following, uh, I think you kind of want to figure out what like what you can offer people like why why would they invest their subscription uh, uh on you um because they don't have to follow you there's no there's nobody has a right to you know uh, uh, a following on social media or anywhere else so um for me obviously that was education i've been teaching for a long time and so it was a pretty simple idea to just transition my my teaching and my ideas, my thoughts about that, my, my philosophies, reflections, etc., onto social media channels. And I think at that point, you know, it's important to be like really generous. Actually, it sounds kind of funny, but um, you don't want to like, you don't want to, you know, be kind of holding back. You just want to like kind of, you know, share with the world what you have to share and then they'll either like it or not like it but you've got to be kind of in it um uh for the long haul and and also you have to understand very well like what what you're offering to people i think those things are i find like really important in kind of i guess making it if you will uh, i've thought actually about because every <laughs> it's funny like there's so many of these things out there that are like where you know there's some instagram guru that is like gonna tell you, ah, listen, you do these, take my online course and I will show you how to build a following on Instagram. And uh, I think that's fine and cool, you know, whatever everybody's, there's probably some really useful ideas in it uh, as well. But you know, like the bottom line is, you gotta make content that like connects with people uh, that they find value in, right? That's the other thing too, is I'm, I'm really big on like, whenever I make a post or I, or I do something or even like this, like, like these live streams, right? What value is there in this for, for the people watching? Well, certainly, you know, you get to um, interact with me on a kind of casual level and, and, and hear my thoughts for, for whatever they're worth about uh, this profession that we're in. Um, uh, but also I thought it was really interesting because, you know, back when I was at school, we all, it was so easy to find like people to connect with to like draw and paint right like there's always some group that was going to do a um a live sketching night or they were going to get together with their friends and and one would pose and everybody else would draw and then you kind of trade but for like online students which is those those are my people you know uh there's not really that that thing is not like baked in <laughs> there's no like studio that we just go to and sketch so I thought, oh, well, I could do live streams where, you know, people can kind of stop in and sketch for an hour or whatever. And I'll provide, you know, some source material and some engagement. And, and that can be like kind of a cool thing uh, to like motivate people, you know. So that's like the value that I wanted to add, um, you know, via these live streams. Uh, so whatever you do, you know, you just want to ask, like, what's what's the value? What's in it for the, the, the people that that you want to be your followers, that you want to engage with? And if you have a good answer to that question, I think that you have probably a really good chance to uh, to build up an audience. Um, uh, you have a good chance to. I mean, after that, it's just stick to itiveness, right? You know, but it's 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 years. It's years long that you have to be kind of doing this stuff. Uh, before it, it starts to, um, uh, for me anyway, uh, before it started to really like become a thing that, that like it's, it's my job now. Like I just, uh, I teach online and I make tutorials and like that's my job. Uh, so yeah, long, long answer to that, right? Uh, so Kim Farrell uh, is asking, how long do you wait to varnish paintings? Six months to keep the paintings until they can be varnished and then released to a client. Yeah, you know, this is where, like, at different points in my career, I've kind of done different things, not because they were good, but because I had to. <laughs> um, so they do make, there is a product called Retouch Varnish. 
and retouch varnish can be useful because it is a varnish application that refreshes the surface of the painting yet does not what's the word like it does not totally uh, interrupt the oxidization process uh, it's it's best to still wait as long as possible before applying retouch varnish it's not like a magic cure-all that we just get to use retouch varnish and then and then it's safe <laughs> Uh, but it does make for a little bit more of a feasible timeline if you're, you know, if you have to send a painting to a show, maybe, you know, for artists, there's so many different, like, reasons uh, for us to not wait the appropriate time to, uh, to varnish a painting. <laughs> but that's how it is. So if you're a professional painter out there, you know, that you have options, but... Um, the best option is to, uh, if you can, to give it that time. But I say that also like full well in the knowledge that it's so rare to actually have the, the time. You know, a lot of times, you know, it's the, the painting is like getting wrapped up and it's got to get out the door. But, you know, um, what's right is right. And that's why uh, George O'Hanlon, um, for his company Natural Pigments, uh, he and his wife Tatiana, who are really cool people. If you ever have a chance to interact with them, uh, they're just like so really just great and generous uh, people. So, um, uh, but what I was saying was, that's why his painting workshop that he gives is called, uh, it's called Best Practices, like the, the painting Best Practices Workshop, which is to say that he fully recognizes that not every oil painter is gonna paint in a way that an archivist or, or like, a, a, what's the word I'm looking for, like an art restorer would recommend, um, you know, basically the safest way. Uh, but if you wanted to paint the safest way, he can tell you how. <laughs> um, uh, which is kind of just an interesting take on, on a workshop, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's really like heavy informational stuff. Um, but what he, I think, expects to happen in conversations with him, uh, this is what he is indicated to me was that he just wants people to make informed choices about what they do with their paintings. Like if you need to, you know, use a varnish in your medium, if you really needed to do that, you know, you should try to do it in the safest way possible. Right. So, um, uh, so that's his kind of idea with, uh, with that, with that workshop is not that people are really going to make perfectly safe paintings forever, but, that if you wanted to, you should be equipped with the knowledge to uh, to do that. Yeah, so uh, cool question there. Um, J JD Anarchy. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Uh, JD Anarchy is asking... Oh, no, I just scrolled past it. That happens so much. All right. When drawing, do you like a paper with a lot of tooth or texture or a smoother paper? Yeah, of course, you know, I'll just do one little tiny caveat with this because in general, I do like a smoother paper. Uh, but the one instance in which I would like a little bit of rougher paper, a toothier paper would be if I'm drawing with charcoal uh, sometimes, or especially vine charcoal. You want to have like a paper that kind of swallows up a little bit more of that, of that charcoal dust. Uh, so... In that instance, then I would, I would use something a bit toothier. But in general, no. Like I'll use uh, paper that is pretty smooth. It's a. I usually use Stonehenge. Probably a lot of you are familiar with it, especially if you're uh, following me on Patreon. Which, by the way, just a side note: um, this month my sepia chalk drawing tutorial came out. And I'm super stoked about it, super proud about it. Love the drawing, love the process. And uh, if you're into kind of learning about drawing and painting, portraiture, etc., cetera, um, I think that you could do a lot worse than checking out my, my Patreon page. So that's my, my little plug for, uh, yeah, anyway, that's all. Let's see. Paul Pina is saying... I want to study at the FAA in the future. What do I need to study there? Well, you need certainly um, 
uh, uh, well, interesting question. Uh, what do you need to study there? Certainly, like a lot of the things that that I recommend to students anyway. You know, I talk about tenacity, things like this. Uh, I think those those are all very important. Uh, I would say that one of the very important things about studying, and I think this actually kind of this is really advice that also is going to apply in other areas. But you really do kind of need to be a self starter. You know, as as artists, I think. It's very difficult to, what's the word? Uh, actually, sorry, hold on one second. Yeah. Well, anyway, sorry, uh, technical difficulty. Uh, but what I was going to say is that as an artist, you kind of need to, um, you, you can't take a lot of motivation from the outside. You, you really need to, be kind of like self-driven and, and able to kind of sustain yourself uh, from that. Uh, also, when you're studying at somewhere like, like the Florence Academy, you know, you're going to be in a situation where like everybody there uh, obviously is talented. Everybody there is driven. And so like the kind of pool of people that you're, it's not necessarily about competing, but um in a way, the pool of people there that you're interacting with are going to be like in general kind of super motivated and you need to be like kind of a part of that that wave. And so uh, kind of bringing somebody to the table in that respect, I think, puts you in a much better position to succeed at a school like that. Um, because it's not like you think, oh, well, you go to drawing school, like they'll just teach you how to draw, but it's there's a lot more kind of in it than that, you know, um, you're kind of learning a bit a lifestyle and, you know, part of it is that you need to like be in Florence, you need to like soak up what's there. Uh, so if you're if you're just kind of waiting around to for people to like feed you information, you're really going to get half of what you should be getting out of that experience. Uh, so I think that sense of like self motivation is is a really big part of what you need if you're going to be successful studying at really any atelier. Right, so let's see questions. Kim Farrell asks, have you been able to sell your drawings off of Patreon? I think it draws a different market. That's an interesting question. I actually never, <laughs> the funny thing is I get so busy with like other stuff. It's it's very difficult actually to, to take the time also to, um, uh, to market drawings and paintings. So my my job as a teacher eventually has kind of meant like I don't I don't have as much time to really like sell my work. I haven't honestly put any thought into it in I don't know a year. I I literally haven't like lifted a finger to to do anything about that. There was a show a little while back at Arcadia that I sent a drawing to and um uh, I was happy enough that that found a, a place to be, so that's good. But otherwise, I I literally haven't even. This is the first time I've thought about it. Is this is this question? So, uh, for whatever that's worth, um, I guess I should. I've been I wasn't meaning to like. Oh, I should put. You know, I have a website anyway. I should just put like some work available there, and and also because. The other thing with drawing, and this is you know speaking again to what. I mentioned earlier about, you know, saying a gallerist will, you know, I've heard them say to me like, oh, uh, we don't really sell drawings. Send us some paintings if you have. Um, is that, you know, there there's a whole group of people through Patreon that are like acclimated and understand, you know, what my drawings are all about. Obviously, some of those people would probably like to collect them. So, yeah, I should uh, anyway. It's a good reminder, Kelly, that I should get on top of that and do something about it. Let's see. Gerald Garas says, shout out from the Philippines. Shout out back to you, Gerald. And let's see. Cypher619 says, did you learn comparative measurements at the Florence Academy? If so, how did it work? No, no, actually, it's uh, that's a totally different kind of system of observation there. That's... Um, at FAA, you're always going to use site size, and uh, maybe they're a bit um, sniffy about comparative measurements. Uh, 
eventually, you know, in, in my own um, kind of post education, education, uh, I got much more into that and um, uh, saw the value in it. So for me, that was, yeah, I'd, I'd use probably I use primarily comparative measurements uh, nowadays, uh, but also in a way a little bit, I would say, construction, which is, it's like a different kind of search for accuracy really um and yeah well anyway all my tutorials are about that anyway so <laughs> the best way to explain that would just be to go like watch what's available on youtube or, or wherever uh, rather than to to try and explain it all here but uh cool question though uh let's see mod nur alam asks which academic artist would you recommend to animators Ooh, interesting question uh, for anatomy and basics, which animators would you recommend if a student was to pursue animation? <sighs> I mean, it's a little bit, I got to be honest, it's a little bit outside of my kind of scope of knowledge. So, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I have a really amazing answer uh, to that in terms of like animators. You know, I just know that if you're, if you're into animation, if you're looking you know, for, for that kind of learning, uh, I think that, um, you know, going on, uh, well, all right. Okay. You know what? I do know one, uh, Will Weston, I think is really cool. I follow him on Instagram. If you, uh, if you don't follow him there, he's definitely worth, um, uh, worth a couple of clicks and worth a follow. Um, really, really great kind of, uh, um, teacher of kind of drawing, uh, from imagination, which which maybe is even, even is a little bit of a misnomer, like you're kind of drawing more from your stored or accrued visual memory than you are imagination exactly. But you, you get the same idea. It means the same thing, I think, just expressed slightly differently. But Will Weston's a really uh, really cool one that that I follow. Uh, so so definitely give him a um, give him a look, give him a follow. Um, I think you will not regret it. Uh, let's see here. Doug Ferron asked, do you do charcoal drawings or exclusively pencils? Oh, yeah, I do charcoal drawings. I did charcoal drawings for years. Uh, in fact, um, you know, when I was a student, it was, you know, it was all charcoal drawings, uh, you know, or, or probably like 90% of what we did was charcoal drawings um, and working in, uh, working in oil paint. It's just kind of traditional media, you know, just standard stuff that, that, uh, that you would have to learn. Um, but nowadays, uh, you'll find me way more often using uh, using graphite than you will charcoal, partly because you know charcoal's just it just gets everywhere, doesn't it? Um, and I, you know, I have my studio at home, uh, you know, like uh, so I kind of prefer to if I can avoid it, I'll avoid having uh, having charcoal dust kind of floating around. That being said, it's not like graphite dust is fantastic for you, like. Uh, um, but it's the lesser, for me, the lesser of two evils, a little bit, uh, less destructive. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, uh, that's that. Let's see, uh, Delbert, uh, let's see. Oh no, a whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of questions that uh, just popped in to the feed. Old Dirty Master says, thanks for the fun stream. If you could own any two or three paintings for a year to study them, which ones would you choose? Wow. What a question. Lo I love a good, like, kind of fantastic, never could happen question. <laughs> like a good hypothetical. Uh, what do I think would be, what would I think would be really cool to own? Hmm. I don't want to mess this up because I only get a ch it's, it's like one chance to, to own the paintings. Um, probably... I would have to start with a Lepage. And since this is like fantasy world, it would have to be Lepage's Joan of Arc, just because, not because necessarily even, like there's a whole lot of technical stuff that I, I'm just dying to know about that, but it's just such an amazing painting. And if, if I'm talking about a fantasy of owning paintings that I can't own, that's like on the list for sure. Uh, so that one, just by default, I have to have. Um, after that, maybe something 
maybe I would go with something a little bit more technical uh, that I was actually kind of interested about. Uh, and then I would say, you know, probably a Bouguereau painting. Not because I feel like his technique is like my favorite technique, but it's a very compelling technique. And if I could study it up close uh, for a prolonged period, um, I'm sure I would do nothing except gain from, from that experience. Uh, so I would, by default, I think I just have to put Bouguereau in there uh, because he's such an amazing technician. And if we're talking about studying technique, I'd want to know what his technique was all about. Um, after that, Bonat. Probably uh, Leon Bonat. Um, I think his painting technique is very direct. It's, in that sense, like probably very simple. But I think it's, I just find it highly creative. I think it's really some of the stuff that he does with paint. I, th I just find really fascinating, like his approach to it. Uh, so probably take uh, a Bonat painting as well. So those are my, those are my answers. Uh, let's see. By the way, for those of you who are watching on Instagram, probably the feed is going to die in a minute because my phone's going to die. Um, but uh, yeah, you can switch over to YouTube anytime. Just Stephen Baumann artwork on YouTube. Nathan Schult is asking, how do you overcome the tooth of the paper when toning with graphite? Recently tried toning some Legion Stonehenge paper, it's cotton powder graphite, and realized it produced uniform noise well i guess you're talking about toning it with like dry graphite as opposed to wet graphite which would be um a slightly different uh slightly different process uh, but with a similar outcome um i'm not sure uh, i mean I'm not sure if i totally understand uh the noise that you're referring to um so maybe i can't can't actually answer the question with that much uh, uh, clarity. I'm sure it's a good question, and I just I don't think I understand it totally. And uh, Dark Dark Club is asking: Is there any technical reason that you're using a very hard and dry brush? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that have tuned in, like after a while, this is what I'm making here is a, a no tan study, which is essentially a study of the basic value configuration of a painting. Uh, so it's, it's purposefully quite simplified. Uh, it's meant to focus only on the, uh, the simplest value relationships. And hopefully within that kind of reveal something interesting about the painting that uh, in some ways could be hidden in the values, if that makes, uh, if that makes sense. So that's what that's what this is all about, is just trying to unlock the um, you know, if there's any secrets tied up in those values, that's what I'm going to be figuring out here. Yeah, and so far, I don't know if I would say that I feel like there's secrets in the values, but, you know, Sargent, the thing, and I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again. One of the things I find so absolutely fascinating with him is the way that he keeps his values so compressed. Like, there is just no kind of nonsense in his in his painting like if he can if he can keep the values the same he's going to do it uh, and it, it leads to eventually like some really beautiful shape design you know I think we're all we're all you know all the time like fussing over and obsessing over shape design and things uh, as representational painters uh, but shape design also requires like a value organization it just it's not just the shapes uh, the shapes kind of reveal themselves because of the the value organization. And if you don't have that organization of values, you're not gonna you're not gonna get the shapes. So one of the things that I see in Sargent, I'm always so fascinated by in Sargent, is his like insistence on the unity of value and, and uh, all the things that that kind of produces for him, all the opportunities that that kind of creates. You know, um, and it's something I think we we kind of know a little bit as students we kind of know oof i need to unify these values i need to unify them i need to unify them but you know there's a challenge in that like our eyes want to kind of tell us something a little bit different and um and so that's when you know you you have to make that that call where do i where do i unify and where do i spend my my extra 
my extra value, you know. Anyway, I, I find that really, that challenge really intriguing. Always have. Right, so let's see. Jonathan Chavez is saying, I'm late. What did I miss? <laughs> uh, I don't know, a lot, a lot of conversation, but um, this stream will still be here anyway, so uh, no worries there. Um, what else? Todd, Mc Todd McCrory is asking, is, is your approach to studying shadow shapes the same when you're drawing, I'm trying to figure out what I'm missing in my sketching skills? Yeah, absolutely. You know, shape design is just a topic that goes on and on forever. It's kind of just all encompassing. You know, you um, everything you do is a, is going to relate to shape design from your value organization uh, all the way to your kind of vision of, of rendering. All that is going to be is going to relate to going to create um, relationships that 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 show the uh the shapes that you're able to design so um in terms of like what you what you need to do or like what um uh like what your approach is i think like once you start to I, all right so here's an interesting thing right shapes i think in a way from artist to artist right they they differ you know it's, it's like the kind of thing where two artists can see the same portrait and make, I think, very diversely different shapes um, out of that. Now, in itself, maybe that's interesting, maybe not, but what it says is that shapes are a lot about, like, kind of taste in a way, right? Like, we will draw and, or tend to paint and draw, like, the things that are significant to us that, that we find interesting or, or attractive, beautiful, pleasing, however you want to put it. But then that means like that shape selection is also going to take place in a way like along those lines. Um, so when you're thinking about shape design, you also got to think about like what what constitutes like an attractive or what constitutes like a beautiful shape. How do we know one from the other? Uh, and if this sounds like really academic and kind of pedantic, then, you know, it is. I mean, it's. But that's, I think, sometimes a place that you have to go to when you're thinking about, um, you know, how to, to solve these problems in your own work. Um, you need to understand, like, why you would design a shape a certain way or, or why you'd take a, a choice that you'd take. So not so much an answer, but uh, maybe a, um, just a reflection on, on the nature of, like, searching for shapes. I think it's, I think it's about your taste. You've got to decide, like, I think first, like, what do you like? What do you find attractive, you know? That's why master studies are so cool is that you get to kind of spend some time, you know, in the shoes, so to speak, of that of that artist. And you get to walk over their shapes a bit and see what shapes they were making, you know? Um, and so that's why, you know, you always see me working with Sargent is that I just want to kind of see what he saw, like see what shapes he was making, man, like, Obviously, they're genius shapes, you know, there's not, not too much debate about that. So, uh, oh, a name that I totally can't uh, pronounce, but the last name is uh, Padam. It says, please guide a bit trampoline line and bridge line and portrait drawing. I don't know mm -hmm. what either of those things are, so I can't really speak to that. Um, Todd McCrory is asking... Oh, no, sorry. Uh, let's see. Uh, Barry Grayson is asking, are there any things that distinguish the Florence Academy from the Angel Academy? Well, you know, I mean, I didn't study at the Angel, Angel Academy, so I, I, can't, I can't really speak to exactly their program. Uh, but I know, like, kind of anecdotally, just uh, watching between the two, if I said what would distinguish one from the other, I think that at the Angel Academy... There is certainly a stronger focus on on rendering a, a, a figure or a portrait in, in paint, um, which is to say that like the process of like making something look quite finished, they have a really concrete way to to organize that. And I think that is very much to the advantage of, of students. 
that are kind of going through the program. Uh, at the Florence Academy, the process of making an oil painting or finishing an oil painting is a little bit more nebulous, uh, but that offers you also the freedom of having a little bit more interpretation. So it's probably more variety in general uh, in terms of like the painters that will come out of the uh, the Florence Academy. But there's a sacrifice to that as well. Like, you know, by by making the, the process like a little bit less prescriptive, they also like make it so it's a little bit more difficult to communicate what it is. You know, so I think there's a lot of confusion around the Florence Academy of like, how exactly do I like just make a painting? Um, now, eventually, by the way, there's answers to those things. It's not to say like there isn't. Uh, but like I said, it's just a, one that leaves or, or is, is there to leave a little bit more room for interpretation, like personal interpretation. Uh, and that's by design, you know, and, and I think there's nothing, uh, certainly nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if you're someone who wants like a little bit more of a concrete procedural approach, um, then, then the Angel Academy would be a little bit more for you. Uh, but hey, you know, I mean, I I didn't actually really choose between the two. I kind of I kind of heard about the Florence Academy and I was like, all right, I'm just going to go there and let's make this thing happen. <laughs> let's see how to make this work. And uh, and eventually, you know, you, you make it work. Um, uh, kind of life comes at you a lot of different ways and you try and your best to figure it out. And that's what you do. Uh, so I don't think you're really going to go wrong at either place, but... Uh, that's my two cents about the kind of difference in between the two. Yeah, so the Instagram stream is really uh, about to about to die out. I'm just going to end that real quick. For those of you watching on YouTube, um, I'm going to keep going. But uh, but my yeah, sorry. So just a little interruption to the stream. Uh, forget actually I don't know what time it is right now but I plan to go for a couple hours I think we're probably close to a couple hours in um, I don't know yeah anyway whatever I'm here for uh, <laughs> for more chat and more dry by the way I hope I really really hope that 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 some of you most of you all of you out there have your sketch pads or something and you're like kind of drawing along with me uh, I know this one, this particular live stream, I just did it on, on the whims. I had some time and I wanted to kind of dive back into this painting for a minute. But in the future, I'm going to try to uh, communicate in advance, you know, when the streams are coming. So, uh, so you all can kind of draw along. Um, like I said, it's an ambition of mine for this to be like a bit of a motivation for for those of you like, who don't maybe have a, a community of people to draw with, like that we can kind of meet up a little bit and just sketch. For me, like it's just, I'm just drawing like, I know I'm kind of technically answering questions, but uh, it doesn't, I talk all the time about drawing, so it's not, uh, uh, it's not um, the most taxing uh, thing for me to do while I'm, while I'm sketching. Uh, so I'm just seeing this as like a nice, chill, casual drawing evening. Um, and if you all do that too, that's fantastic. If not, yeah, well, oh, okay, that's cool too. But, uh, but just know that's like kind of my, my purpose. Why well, I put the, the source image on the screen as well, because I feel like, um, you know, you can just be at your computer, you know, or whatever, your iPad, your phone, just sketching away, hopefully. That's like my, my vision of like how all that works. But, uh, anyway, just let me know if you are, by the way, if you, uh, if you are like sketching along and stuff, you know, post it on uh, post it on IG and tag me, uh, so I can see your um, your your study as well, and I'll I'll shoot you a like or uh, or a share or something. Um, yeah. Anyway, so let's see. Barry Grayson says thanks for the uh, um, answer regarding the distinction between the Florence Academy and Angel Academy. Ash Ash Ashutosh. Kotavadekar is asking what kind of lights you're using for models and on your paper. Yes, uh, I've got this question a lot. 
I, I'm pretty sure that it's that I do have it listed in the FAQ section on my Patreon page. But just in case I don't, I'll let you know here. Uh, they're, first of all, by the way, I'll just disclaimer, they're really expensive lights. And, uh, you know, I've invested in them because obviously they're, I use them for my job. So I need really, uh, really good lights. You can't film with, with bad lights. Uh, but the lights that I use are the Aperture Lightstorm 120D Mark II. And I have two of them and uh, I have on both of them a rather large softbox. A softbox is essentially like a really big diffuser. So uh, this basically takes the, uh, the light and kind of spreads it. So like the initial LED diode is rather small, but this takes and kind of spreads that, that light over a much larger space. Uh, so that is the light that I use, the Aperture Lightstorm 120D Mark II, and uh, I use a 36 inch softbox, octagonal softbox with a white interior, actually. The, uh, it's important the color of the interior of the softbox because it will affect eventually like the color of the uh, the light output uh, so that is what to get if it's available where you are usually uh, I think about each one it's probably gonna run you around like probably about 900 US for for each light Um, I know by the way there are like less expensive alternatives these ones I bought obviously for the quality and uh, not the not the price but I know that for a lot of you out there that's not um, like price is a consideration because it's maybe you're just starting out and you're just trying to figure out how to make all this stuff work and so like really big expensive lights are not on the menu that's that's cool too uh, they make like um, other brand versions of these these kinds of lights they're just LED cans basically and then, you know, they have these passages where you can affix various things to them. And so, uh, so yeah, that's what I use. Hopefully that, uh, that helps out um, uh, in your search for some, uh, some good lights. Uh, <laughs> Dark Club is asking, is studying the Florence Academy really worth it? Is someone who lives in the Middle East to become a professional artist in an academic way? And then Jessa McLaughlin is asking, anyone else think Stephen kind of sounds like Morgan Freeman? Fair question. I, I don't know. I'll have to ask my wife about that and see what she, what she thinks. It'd be great if I sounded like Morgan. I would be really flattering. If anybody else thinks that, please tell me. Uh, because that would really... Uh, I'd be, I think I was really cool at that point. Um, is it worth it to study at FAA? Hey, you got to study somewhere, you know. Um, I mean, that's just my, listen, that's my opinion. I know a lot of people out there are self-taught, and I get that. Uh, you know, I worked for, uh, as an artist for a while uh, without, without studying. I, I, the only reason I really recommend uh, a lot, earnestly, for people to study uh, somewhere is just that I know how hard it was to, to actually just figure it out all on my own. Um, and I kind of feel like I know the things that I was, I was really missing, uh, in doing so. So anyway, that's, you know, for what it's worth, that's my opinion about it. Uh, but there's, Hey, you know what? There's a lot of different paths out there, you know, and it's not one size fits all. So it was worth it for me. I'll say that. Like I had a really, you know, great, uh, experience studying this stuff, met people that changed my life for the better in so many ways. Um, anyway, so yeah, I found it to be a lot of value for, uh, for, for the investment for sure. Let's see here. M Collins is saying, I've been trying to transition from charcoal to graphite and I'm finding the edge control much more difficult. Wanting to hear about your experience with the two yeah, well, edge control. Yeah, I mean, charcoal can be like a little bit more painterly. You know, the interesting thing about these questions sometimes, though, is that like kind of it's a, it's a matter of perspective because, you know, when I think of edge control, I think I have so much more edge control with, uh, with graphite, actually. 
Um, but it's, you know, it's going to be that kind of thing where it's a little bit in the eye of the practitioner, you know, like you, you got to be used to using it to like to see it that way. And so I could understand how it, it might seem like you have more control with uh, with charcoal, but for sure, you know, you're not in the long term, you're not going to be like struggling with edge control for um, in in graphite. It's got plenty to give in, in that respect. So no worries there. Just in the other thing about it is, is that uh, you want to rely on your values for edge control, uh, you know, um, manipulating the substance itself is probably the uh, as as an art teacher, you know, I gotta say it's it's not the way that I certainly recommend to um, address edge issues. And I'm not saying you you are doing that. I just mean to say that like um, if you apply yourself well to uh, to value organization with graphite, it will definitely reward you with uh, with good edges. Let's see. Fortunes is saying, what was the process like when you decided to go to Florence to study? Man, it was crazy. <laughs> I mean, looking, looking back on it, it was like totally, totally crazy because I'm just like, I'm from Miami originally. And, uh, you know, I, I did not at all come from uh, a well-to-do background. So like even the idea of studying in Florence was a little bit like, it was a little bit crazy to me. Like, I just, that's not like a thing that people in my community did. We didn't just like run off to Europe and study. Uh, so even the idea that I could do that was a little bit of like kind of a long shot uh, in my, uh, yeah, when when it was proposed to, to do so. I just had kind of applied because a friend of mine applied and uh, he said, oh, you should have. I mean, we both like realist painting. You know, we were, when we went to college, uh, I went to a really small college in North Florida for a couple of years. Um, he was really into kind of realism and so on and knew like a lot more about it than I did uh, at the time. And so he said, yeah, we should apply. So I just applied and like, quite honestly, I just forgot about it. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'll apply to this school in Italy. It doesn't cost anything to apply. So, you know, I just, I just applied. And not even really having an expectation of being accepted to it. You know, I, I was just, um, I was really just mediocre to average painter, whatever, nothing, nothing noteworthy, uh, um, about anything that I, that I had made in, in college. So, uh, eventually when I got accepted, it was a little bit of a surprise. And then I had to like figure out, okay, well, how do I get to Florence to study? Like it costs money for real <laughs> to like go to Italy and study. Uh, so I really had to figure out and focus on figuring out how to do that. And, you know, I worked and uh, was fortunate enough to get a little help from my, uh, from my family. And so, you know, uh, eventually like I, I made it there with my tuition and my rent and, you know, yeah. Anyway, it was a long, it was a long journey and a lot of, good fortune a lot of help along the way um which i think is probably how how most people end up uh, making it through their their time at the uh, at the academy so the process was a little bit of a chaotic one uh but it involved really working my uh, butt off to try to make enough money to uh to stay there you know i mean remember at the time you probably pay about 400 euros a month uh, in rent in florence and that was, you know, that was, that was pretty, I think that was a pretty uh, uh, average price to, um, uh, to pay to your, your landlord there. Um, but then, of course, like, because you're studying in a foreign country, you can't, you can't work while you're studying. And so, um, also, by the way, like, as hard as you're working, there's not, it's not like a lot of energy you have left over just uh, to spend on a job. Anyway. Sorry, just, I was like reminiscing in my head about, you know, my time in Florence and, and all the stuff I went through. But that's probably not so interesting for uh, all of you watching the stream. Let's see. Uh, Jami is asking, oh, I can't post this, though. I have to submit to Cornelia Hannes on the 19th for a critique. All right. Yeah, OK. I get that. Um, let's see. 
Let's see. Uh, all right. So Doug Ferron is asking, what are your feelings on anatomy study over drawings or paintings or, or over drawing or painting what you see? Hey, my opinion is that I don't think there's a difference there. <laughs> I think that is a, one of these classic uh, like false dichotomies that you will either do one or the other. I think that uh, for me, anatomy was always a way to actually understand what I'm seeing instead of kind of assuming that... Um, now, now, all right, let's be fair. I want to be fair to the question. I'm not being fair. That was me not being fair to the question. What the question is, is that essentially do you rely on just what is visually apparent or would you prefer to i'm not even going to use the word augment because i really don't believe that that, that that's what anatomy is doing but uh, rather than using something else to help you understand what you're seeing just to respond to what is visually there like an impressionist in a way so probably you you understand from uh from my, my initial reaction, that I'm a really big believer in anatomy. I, I think also because I studied so long, and listen, this is something also about the, when you hear me express opinions about working from photos or working from life or uh, drawing just what you see or drawing uh, with uh, an anatomical uh, focus. I'm talking about these things from a perspective of having done both. Uh, I spent a long time really uh, just studying, uh, in a way, just what I could see, you know, what I could squint down and what I could tell about the subject just from looking at it. That was probably four years of my painting education were just spent doing that uh, with very little input from uh, anatomical studies and, and sources. Uh, eventually, though, I feel like I hit a ceiling to where, you know, my level of understanding... Uh, uh, and representation was becoming limited by the fact that I didn't really truly understand what I was seeing. And it was at that point at which I realized I, I really need to study anatomy to, to elevate my, my drawing and painting. So it was not uh, just that I, I went to some school where they were like, oh, everybody, let's all just study anatomy. There was an anatomy program for sure. It's not that, that there isn't that. It's just that it was... Um, uh, really primarily, predominantly a visual school uh, to the extent that I would even say, ironically, because they had an anatomy program, that there was a little bit of like controversy between the anatomy program and like, you know, some parts of the school that would just prefer that you just squint down and, and just look at stuff. Uh, so for whatever that's worth, you know, that was that was certainly my experience. And uh, I'm a really big believer in just understanding what you're seeing, looking deeper into what you're seeing. And anatomy is a great way to do that. You know, if you love painting the human figure, I think that you are never going to regret taking an anatomy course or studying anatomy in, in depth. Uh, you, you're only going to be happy that you, that you did so. So that's my two cents. Uh, Jamie is asking... Let's say this were an analog drawing. Would you just go over it like you did with the eye process? Just starting, just start oil painting process. Well, if this were an analog drawing uh, or painting, I guess we're saying if this was an analog painting, uh, what would kind of be different? I think in an analog painting, my preliminary process would have been a little bit, I, I would have, probably cared a little bit more about it like usually when i'm blocking in something digitally especially during, like, during a live stream i just go for it you know there's nothing you know there's nothing that's gonna hold me back if i if i did it like even slightly the wrong way um in a in a digital painting so i just kind of go with the flow uh, when i'm doing those and and don't really worry about it so that that probably would have been different i would have I would have uh, made my, my underpainting, I guess, or my block in like a little bit more specific, probably a little bit more um, uh, refined. I mean, it's not a, really that big a difference, but that's what I would have done. 
Sarah Choi says, how long did you study at the Florence Academy and did you learn quite a bit of Italian at that time? Hmm. Well, inevitably, not as much Italian as I should have. Uh, you know, looking back on it, you know, uh, yeah. I would have liked to have studied more uh, Italian. I didn't, um, probably because I was being like a lazy American and not doing it and I should have done it. <laughs> Those are the facts, people. But also, you know, my defense, you know, you're already working really, really hard at painting and learning to kind of paint and draw and whatever time that I had uh, was not spent uh, in a language course. It was spent, you know, in museums or, or studying drawing and painting in earnest. So that's my my poor defense for uh for my bad Italian. By the way, I learned a bit of Italian. When, when I go back to Italy now, I can speak a little bit and get, get around and, you know, uh, um, you know, order food and, and whatever. But, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm certainly not like writing, uh, writing letters to people in Italian. That's not, that's not a thing that's happening. Um, uh, so anyway, that's what it is. Uh, oh, and I studied, I studied there for, for four years and, uh, I was, and I, I taught there for about 12 years after, after studying, so, um, yeah, so anyway, that was a long, long, long chapter in my life that uh, eventually closed when I moved to Norway, which was always kind of a dream of, uh, my wife's Norwegian, and so a long time ago we decided, like, we really want to be in Norway, um, and it was just a matter of kind of figuring out how to how to get here. You know, I mean, you gotta gotta make a living, everybody. So let's see. Jamie is asking: Graffiti was your first passion? No, it's correct. It was. And I read it very much to an interview. I heard you talking about your brother in graffiti because that's how I started drawing. Yeah, you know, graffiti was a really big part of my life. You know, and it's. In, you know, nowadays it's kind of, uh, it's probably like more is made out of it than, than it really like has an impact on my life. I think it's an interesting like story, you know, that, that, yeah, I was, I was a graffiti writer and for, for years that's what I did. And, you know, it was my first kind of introduction into painting was my, my brother's, uh, graffiti. I would, I would do copies of that, um. By the way, like my first master copies. Uh, but, you know, nowadays is maybe it's so far in the rearview mirror. It, uh, I could have started in, in a lot of different ways, probably. Maybe it contributes a little bit to, uh, you know, I, maybe I have a more open mind about uh, different kind of modes of representation. Like I'm not such like a really hard line realist uh, about things. You know, I think. I think it's interesting for people to uh, work in in ways that are, you know, stylistically divergent from nature. I think that's I have no problem um, getting into that. I think maybe there's some of that comes from, uh, you know, the fact that being a graffiti writer, that's the world you're kind of coming out of, you know. Um, but anyway, yes, it's true that it was like the first, uh, my first kind of, practice drawing and painting was was done uh done in miami it was done on walls and it was done can i admit that it's done illegally anyway uh, let's move on quickly from uh from that let's see uh kex the artist asks for likeness which one is more imp important learning anatomy or learning to draw what you're seeing uh, you know, sure, to be fair to the question, uh, let's say that, that you can have one that's like more important or the other. I think that it sets up a little bit of a, to me, like, it's not like my favorite question, like to try and choose in between, um, you know, one or the other to say this is better or, or, or more important than that. I mean, it's all interconnected, you know? And as much as we try to separate it, that's actually like where we start to make a lot of mistakes that like, oh, well, I can get good at this without bothering with that. And as soon as you start doing that, it's 
and that's not, maybe not what you're doing. You're just asking like a question about it. But um, I think as soon as you start doing that, then you're like kind of pushing things a little bit down the the priority list, and and you have an opportunity to miss out. I think on on things that otherwise could be really uh, could make a really big impact on your on your work. So I would say, you know, certainly it's all important. Um, and especially in terms of like making a likeness because you know a likeness is so much a combination of things uh, you know i get the question a lot of like how do you like get better at at making a like likeness and i think it's like well you practice all the other stuff that's how i got better at making a likeness was um actually by doing all the other kind of fundamental things really uh better uh, better than i did b before yeah so i think we must be at a couple hours here, give or take, and uh, I'm not totally unhappy with my do-over of this portrait. Uh, so I think we might, I might have to call it quits pretty soon here. Uh, also because being in Norway, it's getting a little bit late. Um, and maybe I'll put in a little bit of this reflective light just to see what comes out of that. Um, but yeah, maybe a couple of questions to end with. Uh, let's see. Some of my friends tried to push me to graffiti too. Never had the courage to do it. It seems so hard. Yeah, well, you know, graffiti, it's challenging. And it's it's also, it's not the like most supportive <laughs> group of artists that you could be around. You know, it's highly competitive and... Uh, um, and people are not shy to tell you what they think of your work, especially when they think something badly. So, um, uh, you, you can't be, uh, you can't have too, um, soft a skin if you're going to get into graffiti writing, uh, or at least, you know, back in the, back when I was doing it in the nineties, that was the way who can say what, what it's like nowadays. Um, uh, but whenever I get into that conversation, I start to feel so old. So I'm like, ah, the kids today, I wonder what they're doing. <laughs> uh, and then I immediately go like uh, recoil in horror at, at the fact that I'm uh, getting older and older. But anyway, not that you guys need to know any of that. Let's see. Uh, Edge Loop Gaming says, just want to say thank you for all the amazing content you put out. You're very welcome. Uh, and Alsdom Saddle says, what part of making artwork gives you the most enjoyment? This, this is a kind of cool question. This will probably be the last, this will be the last like question question I'll, I'll do. And then um, hopefully, uh, yeah, we just wrap up the, uh, the stream here. But in terms of like the most gratification, the most joy, is it what part of the, yeah, what part of making the artwork? I think that it's kind of this process of like bringing something that doesn't exist like into the world. Like you ha kind of have this vision that you think, okay, what if I did it this way? I mean, that's usually how like my work starts out is I kind of have this idea of like, oh, well, what if I, what if I try to do it this way? What if I, you know, what if I, instead of, um, you know, uh, working, you know, just with, with graphite and, uh, and paper. What if I'm, you know, toning that paper with different pigments and because I'm using those different pigments, you know, I have this warmth in the shadow. And what if I try to like kind of draw in a way like around that warmth so that I can kind of maintain some of the warmth in the shadow while I get the cool. And the... Anyway, so like all this, like, this is like process of unfolding uh, this idea um, that kind of comes out of your imagination, which I know that like strictly speaking, I'm, I'm, I draw and I paint what I see. Like I'm a, I'm a representational artist. So I'm not like drawing out of my imagination, but it would be incorrect to, to say that like, I don't like, I do imagine my work. Like that's how I come up with the technical ideas to do what I want to do. Uh, it's, it's by kind of envisioning it. Um, and then manifesting that. So I think I just really enjoy that 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 process actually kind of from, you know, this is all right, cop out. I kind of enjoy the process from start to finish. 
uh, because each part of it's like so important to to the realization of that of that vision, right? So everything from my my first like daydream of what the the painting should look like or the, what the drawing should look like, all the way through like preparing the paper for the the drawing, um, all the way through to uh, you know the 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 first marks of the block in i find like a super engaging time like i'm really um i'm really just like kind of all in like completely invested in the the painting process or the drawing process at that point you know so yeah i can't really i can't really take that any of those parts away and still enjoy them like enjoy the whole the whole process it has to be done I think like uh, together. So that's my my answer. Um, like it or not, that's that's how I feel about it. <laughs> and there's a lot of other questions uh, that came in as well. But I think uh, I've got a jet. I've got to go. I've got stuff to do. I've got places to be. Uh, <laughs> more likely, I got to make dinner for my my wife. But um, anyway, thanks for showing up for the stream. If you want to sketch along with this later, it's going to be up on YouTube. And uh, also, please make sure to subscribe. That way you get notified for the next one uh, when I actually put out some advance notice about it so that you can sketch along with me and uh, uh, listen while we kind of chit-chat about learning to draw and paint and stuff like that. If you're interested in, in tutorials and things, of course, there is my Patreon page. A link will pop up somewhere in the upper corner of this video that, that, that will take you right to that page if that's something you're interested in. But anyway, once again, thank you guys so much and take care of yourselves, okay?